is on bonding, structure and the properties of matter part 2. This session includes number 1, covalent bonding, the types of structures and its properties, number 2, metallic bonding, types of structures and its properties. Covalent bonding. A covalent bond forms when a nonmetal reacts with another nonmetal and they share a pair of electrons so that both the elements have a full outer shell to make them stable. Electrons can only be shared in their outer shells, which is the highest energy level. Covalent bonds have no charged particles like the ions in ionic bonding. The positively charged nuclei of the bonded atoms are attracted to the shared pair of electrons by electrostatic forces. This makes the covalent bonding strong. Each single covalent bond provides one extra shared electron for each atom. These covalent bonds form molecules. Some of these points might not make sense now, but once we go over how to draw the covalent bonds, which will be in the next slide, it will all make sense. Before we start, remember these two things. When drawing the electron structure, the electrons are usually placed in these four places, as shown on the diagram to the right. This is so that it gives you enough space to draw the sharing of the electrons with other atoms. The next point is, place the electrons in these four places one by one, the diagram on the right shows an example for oxygen. It's not wrong to do it like this, but it will just make your life easier if you do it one by one and you'll understand why when we look at the covalent bonding. Covalent bonds are represented using the dot and cross diagrams. So let's look at a question together. Draw a dot and cross diagram to show bonding in a molecule of ammonia. Step one, draw the outer electron shell for each atom individually. So here's nitrogen and here's three hydrogen atoms. Remember to use dot for one element and a cross for the other. This is so that the sharing of the electrons can be evident. Step two, then you overlap the atoms to demonstrate the covalent bonding, which is a sharing of the electrons. So here's nitrogen overlapping with the three hydrogen atoms. Where the overlap takes place, which is demonstrated with the pink arrow, this is where nitrogen is sharing one electron as well as hydrogen is sharing one electron. So this makes one pair of electrons, which is one single covalent bond. So every place where the hydrogen and the nitrogen overlaps is where a pair of electron is shared. So this means ammonia has three single covalent bonds. A double covalent bond is when two pairs of electrons are shared and a triple covalent bond is when three pairs of electrons are shared. With these two yellow electrons, there are no covalent bonds taking place. This is because both the electrons are coming from nitrogen and there's no sharing of electrons with another atom. And finally, step three, always check to see if each atom has a full outer shell. So for hydrogen, it should have two electrons on the outer shell and for nitrogen, it should have eight electrons on the outer shell. Displayed formulas are another way that covalent bonds can be represented as. Displayed formulas show how all the atoms are arranged and all the bonds between them. Single bonds are usually represented as a single line. So for ammonia, each line between the nitrogen and the hydrogen shows a single covalent bond. So again, in total, it shows three single covalent bonds. Molecular formulas are another way of representing covalent bonds. And molecular formulas basically show the actual number of atoms of each element in the molecule. So for ammonia, it's NH3. The second example is carbon dioxide. Note, always know how the molecular formula looks like for when you're doing covalent bonds. The reason will be explained later on this slide. So the molecular formula of carbon dioxide is CO2. So there should be one carbon and two oxygens. 
The next step is overlapping the atoms, so you have carbon in the middle and oxygen on either side, with each oxygen atom sharing a pair of electrons with the carbon atom. But there's a problem, as now each oxygen atom has 7 electrons and carbon atom has 6 electrons, which is not a full outer shell. And remember, you can't add extra oxygens as the molecular formula is CO2. So instead of sharing one pair of electrons, they need to share two pair of electrons. And the next slide will show how this happens. Here we have the same diagram as the previous slide with one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms sharing one pair of electrons each. The arrow shows the electron from the carbon atom being shared with the oxygen atom on the right. And the next arrow shows the electron on the oxygen atom being shared with the carbon atom. And this is how the diagram will look like. So looking at the overlap between the carbon atom and the oxygen atom on the right, there are two electrons from the oxygen, two electrons from the carbon atom that are being shared. And this is how sharing two pairs of electrons looks like. To work out whether another pair of electrons need to be shared, you need to work out how many electrons there are in each atom. Oxygen on the left has 7 electrons, so it needs one more electron for a full outer shell. This is the same with the carbon atom. Whereas the oxygen atom on the right has 8 electrons, which is a full outer shell, therefore no more sharing of electrons are required on the right hand side. So the electron from the carbon atom is shared with the oxygen on the left. And the electron from the oxygen atom is shared with the carbon atom. And now the diagram will look like this. So both the oxygen atoms are sharing two pairs of electrons with the carbon atom. This forms a double bond. There are still two covalent bonds as there are two oxygen atoms overlapping the carbon. However, in each bond, as there are two pairs of electrons, this makes carbon dioxide have two double covalent bonds. Now, carbon has 8 electrons and each oxygen atom has 8 electrons. This means no more sharing of electrons are required. For the displayed formula, the double bonds are represented as two parallel lines as shown on the diagram below. Example 3, nitrogen. As the molecular formula for nitrogen is N2, this means two nitrogen atoms will be used, as shown below. I have then drawn the number of electrons on its outer shell for each nitrogen atom. The first one is represented as circles, and for the second one it's represented as crosses. Please note, if the molecule that's given has one type of atom only, so this includes Cl2, Br2, F2, N2, then the electrons for each atom should be represented differently, as shown here. So for one of the nitrogen is represented as circles, and for the other nitrogen is represented as crosses. If the molecule that's given has two different types of atoms with two or more of the same type of atom, for example NH3, there are two different types of atoms which are nitrogen and hydrogen, and there are two or more of the same type of atoms because there are three hydrogens. Then in this case, the electrons for the same type of atom are represented by the same symbol. So all the hydrogen atoms will be represented by the same symbol and the nitrogen will be represented by a different symbol. Going back to the nitrogen example, if the two nitrogen atoms were sharing one pair of electrons, then each nitrogen atom will have six electrons on its outer shell, but for a full outer shell it must have eight electrons. So then it goes on to sharing two pairs of electrons, but still the nitrogen doesn't have a full outer shell because it has seven electrons. So it leads on to sharing three pairs of electrons. And now each nitrogen has eight electrons on its outer shell. Therefore, no more sharing of electrons are required. This means nitrogen has one triple covalent bond. The displayed formula for a triple bond is represented as three parallel lines, as shown in the diagram below. Practice dot and cross diagrams for hydrogen, chlorine, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen chloride, water, ammonia, methane and carbon dioxide. And also be able to name the type of covalent bond as well as the number of covalent bonds for each of those examples. It's very useful to know the difference between molecules and compounds and when these terms are used. So, molecules is a general term used to describe when two or more atoms chemically bond together whereas compounds are formed when two or more different elements chemically bond together. To the right, we have got some examples. So phosphorus, which is P4, is a molecule because by definition it has two or more atoms. Same with chlorine and oxygen. 
Looking at calcium chloride, CaCl2, it is a compound because it has two different elements, which are calcium and chlorine, but it can also be a molecule as it has three atoms altogether. Same applies to hydrogen chloride, which is HCl, methane, which is CH4, and carbon dioxide. This concludes all compounds can be molecules, but not all molecules can be compounds. Covalent bonding can form three types of structures. Number one, simple molecular structures. Number two, giant molecular structures. And number three, polymers. In the next few slides, we will cover these type of structures in more detail. Simple molecular structures. Simple molecular structures are composed of molecules but containing a few atoms joined together by covalent bonds. Examples of simple molecular structures are oxygen, hydrogen, fluorine, methane, chlorine and water. On the previous slides, we looked at covalent bonding which holds atoms together to form molecules. Whereas simple molecular structures are composed of many molecules and these molecules are held together by weak intermolecular forces. This is demonstrated on the diagram with green lines between one oxygen molecule and another oxygen molecule. These simple molecules are usually gases or liquids. Properties of simple molecular structures. The first one is they have a low melting and boiling point. This is because there are weak intermolecular forces between the molecules. As the molecules get bigger, the strength of the intermolecular forces increases, so more energy is needed to break the forces. Therefore, the melting and boiling point increases. The second one is they don't conduct electricity. This is because molecules don't have an overall electric charge, so there are no free electrons to move around, even when it's in a liquid or molten state. Bear in mind, you should only use the word intermolecular forces with simple molecular structures. Giant molecular structures, also known as macromolecules. In giant covalent structures, all the atoms are bonded to each other by strong covalent bonds. They are usually all solids. Main examples you need to know are diamond, graphite and silicon dioxide. This will all be covered in more details in the next few slides. Properties of giant molecular structures. The first one is they have a high melting and boiling points as a lot of energy is required to break the covalent bonds between the atoms. The second one is they don't conduct electricity. This is because they don't contain charged particles, therefore there are no free electrons to move around, even in a molten state. There is one exception for this property, which is graphite. Allotropes is a term used in chemistry which is useful to know. Allotropes is the name used for different structural forms of the same element in the same physical state. So, allotropes of carbon includes diamond, graphite, graphene and fullerenes. These are all made up of carbon atoms, but their structures are different. Diamond and its properties. Diamond is an example of a giant molecular structure that is made up of carbon atoms. Each carbon atom forms four covalent bonds. This makes diamonds hard. The carbon atoms form a regular tetrahedral arrangement. Diamonds have a high melting and boiling point due to the strong covalent bonds. And they also don't conduct electricity because there are no free electrons or ions to move around. Graphite and its properties. Graphite is an example of a giant molecular structure that is made up of carbon atoms. Each carbon atom only forms three covalent bonds, creating sheets of carbon atoms arranged in hexagons. A single sheet is called graphene, and many of these sheets form graphite. There aren't any covalent bonds between the layers. Therefore, the layers are held together weakly and they are free to move over each other. This makes graphite soft and slippery. Graphite has a high melting point. The covalent bonds need a lot of energy to break the bonds. And finally, graphite conducts electricity. As carbon has four electrons on the outer shell, it can make four bonds, but with graphite, it only makes three bonds. So each carbon has one electron that is delocalized and can move. This conducts electricity. As graphene is a single layer of graphite, which has strong covalent bonds between each carbon atom, this makes them strong. They also have a higher melting point and can conduct electricity, just like graphite. Fullerenes and its properties. Fullerenes are molecules of carbon atoms arranged in hexagons and shaped like closed tubes or hollow balls. 
Fullerenes can be used to cage other molecules. These structures form around another atom or molecule. This could be used to deliver a drug into the body. Fullerenes have a huge surface area, so they could help make good catalysts. They can also be used to make lubricants. Silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide, also known as silica, is an example of a giant molecular structure and it's made up of silicon and oxygen. This is what sand is made of. Each grain of sand is one giant structure of silicon and oxygen. All the atoms are linked to each other by strong covalent bonds. There are no set numbers of atoms joined together in this type of structure. Silicon dioxide have high melting and boiling points and they don't conduct electricity. Polymers. Polymers are long chains of many small repeating units joined together. They also have strong covalent bonds. Here is an example of how a polymer looks like. Instead of drawing out a whole long polymer molecule, which can contain thousands or even millions of atoms, you can draw the shortest repeating section called the repeating unit. In this case, the repeating unit is ethane, which is made up of carbon and hydrogens. This will be covered in more details in the hydrocarbon topic. The n outside the brackets is the number of times this unit is repeated. So for example, n can be thousand. This unit will then be repeated thousand times. And finally, the bonds are drawn out of the brackets to show that it's joining up with the next repeating unit. Properties of polymers. The intermolecular forces between the polymer molecules are strong compared to the intermolecular forces between small molecules. This makes polymers solid at a room temperature and therefore have a higher melting point as more energy is required to break the bonds. The intermolecular forces are still weaker in comparison to ionic and covalent bonds, so they generally have a lower boiling point than ionic and giant molecular structures. Metallic bonding. Metals also consist of a giant structure arranged in a regular pattern and are solid at room temperature. Metallic bonding is the bonding that occurs in metal elements. The electrons in the outer shell of the metal atoms are delocalized and so they are free to move through the whole structure. This makes the metal atoms become metal ions. There are strong forces of electrostatic attraction between these positive metal ions and shared negative electrons. These forces of attraction hold the atoms together in a regular structure and are known as metallic bonding. The picture on the left shows the positive ions with the negative electrons and then the picture on the right shows once the electrons become delocalized. Properties of metallic bonding. They are electrical conductors because their delocalized electrons carry electric charge through the metal. They are good conductors of thermal energy because their delocalized electrons transfer energy. And they have a higher melting and boiling points because large amount of energy is needed to break the strong metallic bonds between the positive ions and the delocalized electrons. Use the term delocalized electrons to describe the electric conductivity in metals and graphite. And use the term ions that are free to move for the conductivity of molten ionic substances. Metal alloys. Alloys are mixtures of two or more metals or a metal and another element. Alloys are also held by metallic bonding. Most of the metals we use are mostly alloys. This is because pure metals are too soft, so by mixing other metals, this makes them harder and more useful than pure metals. The reason why metal alloys are harder is because different elements will have different sized atoms. So when elements are mixed with the metals, this will distort the layer of metal atoms, making it more difficult for them to slide over each other. The next three slides summarises the key points for each topic covered in part 1 and 2 that you need to know for the exam. So pause this video and go through each point.